Then thank you for being here today. Through the efforts of the law enforcement agencies represented here today, suspect Joshua DaCosta has been linked through DNA to four unsolved rapes in Tulsa County. He was picked up in Oregon by Tulsa County deputies and transported to Tulsa on Tuesday. Three of the rape cases were investigated by the Tulsa Police Department. As far as we know, at this point in time, the first rape case linked to DaCosta occurred in 2008 and was investigated by the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office. In early 2008, a 20-year-old female exited out her back door to let her dog out and was immediately accosted from behind. She was assaulted to the point where she lost consciousness. The victim regained consciousness an hour or so later and called 911. Evidence was recovered that would later link DaCosta to that rape. Due to being unconscious during the sexual assault, the victim could not identify the assailant. Furthermore, the victim is not alive today to inform her that her assailant had been identified. Tragically, the mental and physical pain of this rape took its toll and the victim committed suicide several years later. Although she will not be present to see justice take its course, Due to the efforts of law enforcement, her voice will still be heard. So I want to thank you for being here today, and at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Dennis Larson from the Tulsa Police Department. Thank you all for coming today. For over a decade, the suspect victimized and traumatized several young females. Thanks to the constant advancement in technology, and the unwavering dedication of every law enforcement officer throughout the state who investigated these heinous crimes, this suspect is no longer and no longer ever will harm another innocent victim. Coming forward, naming an abuser, and sharing the details of such atrocities that occurred to these young ladies is incredibly difficult. It requires immense courage on the victim's part. I'm incredibly proud of these young people for their bravery in assisting invest in the investigation and the ensuring, ensuring this predator remains behind bars. The road to recovery will not be easy, but we want to assure these victims and all victims of the sexual assault and the, your law enforcement team, every officer and prosecutor will work tirelessly and work to protect you and bring these monsters to justice. Today with me is Sergeant Van Meer, who led the Tulsa, or City of Tulsa side of this investigation. And on our side, we had in 2013 a 14-year-old victim. In 2015, we had a 25-year-old victim. And in 2019, we had a 14-year-old victim. All of these, all of these have been tied to the suspect that now is being held in David L. Moss and awaiting prosecution in Tulsa County District Court. I want to mention that the Attorney General's office has formed and has met as committee, it's now been formed into a board, the Sexual Assault Forensic Evidence Board. They meet regularly, they bring in investigators from across the state to report out what we're doing in each of our cities, and I can't overstate the importance of that board. Law enforcement has often stood between evil and the citizens that we're sworn to protect. There's no greater threat than sexual assaults and rapes that occur to the innocent people that reside in our city. And we will use every tool, every man, all the manpower we need to bring these type of horrible, just horrible crimes to justice. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to our district attorney, Steve Kunzweiler. So one of the things that uh, I want to convey, at least to our, our Tulsa community, is that uh, one, if you are the victim of a sexual assault, uh, you should know that law enforcement are not going to just take that report and stop. Uh, these uh, investigations are a very good uh, illustration of the effort that law enforcement goes through to pursue something so many years back into the past. Um, for, for victims, uh, I understand how hard it can be to one, come forward, two, trust somebody that you don't even know, and then three, hope that somebody's gonna try and uh, obtain justice for you and remove a perpetrator from the streets. And, and as I said, let this be just a reminder to you that you are going to have the backs 
or the, uh, law enforcement is going to have your back and we're going to continue to um, seek justice on your behalf. Now the flip side of this is very simple. While this is an investigatory process and law enforcement has identified an individual associated with these uh, heinous crimes, uh, any person who's accused of committing crime enjoys what we all do, which is the presumption of innocence. And so while somebody may be arrested and somebody may be accused of a crime, ultimately it's up to a judge or a jury to make that determination. So on behalf of the state of Oklahoma and the district attorney's office, we are certainly uh, look forward to the opportunity to presenting evidence that are associated with these particular cases in a courtroom in which a judge or a jury can be the final arbiter as to uh, the responsibilities for each of these victims in their cases. Thank you. Just for the record, you guys know my name is uh, Hunter McKee, H-U-N-T-E-R-M-C-K-E-E. -E. I'm the Public Information Manager with the Oklahoma State Bureau of uh, Investigation. Um, I just want to start um, by thanking everybody in, in this room. The number one objective when you're talking about a suspect that has committed um, these type of crimes, uh, the number one objective for everybody is to get this person off the street and behind bars. Um, everybody in this room did a tremendous job working together and when you're looking at the the time frame of all of this of, of when the the uh, first victim reported this um, of us working through it and trying to identify the person responsible the bottom line is we kept investigating and it never stopped um, and that's how we were able to uh, eventually identify this person um, and get them off the streets is that everybody continued to work together um, to to get this done uh, and to find justice for 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 the victims uh, and their families who were all um, tragically um, involved in this um, from the OSBI's perspective I'm just going to go back and, and kind of talk about um, kind of going through the case with us our investigative unit as well as our um, OSBI laboratory system um, both had a huge part uh, in this case and both worked together um, in order uh, to get to this, this time period where we are now. Um, regarding uh, the OSBI, uh, through the SOCI, the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative Grant, um, a sexual assault kit was submitted to our lab by the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office um, and was tested uh, by a contracted outside accredited uh, laboratory for DNA analysis. Um, once we received that back, the OSBI Forensic Science Center entered that profile into CODIS, where we received three CODIS hits. Um, once um, the, the suspect, um, or once those hits came back, um, we were um, able to identify the, the suspect, um, as well as um, there were uh, forensically matched um, to two Tulsa Police Department rape cases as well during that entire process. Um, you know, during this entire thing, we really want to thank the BJ, um, BJA for the grant funding that allowed for testing of backlogged and untested sexual assault kits throughout our state. Um, for us, again, this is something that um, our, our laboratory system, the SACI um, sexual assault kit uh, uh, initiative is something that the OSBI is very proud of. It's something that our agents, our criminalists, um, I mean, we're talking about since 2019, we've received thousands of, of, of these kits and have worked through these kits in order to um, identify those affected um, and been able to help them as, as quickly as possible. And working through these kits, um, that's something that um, everybody within the OSBI has done a tremendous job with so far. So again, um, everybody um, who had started this case with us, the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office, um, Tulsa Police Department, uh, we truly thank them. And uh, again, we really appreciate everybody's help throughout this process. Ours was a 14-year-old victim in 2013, a 15-year-old victim in 2000, I'm sorry, a 25-year-old victim in 2015, and a 14-year-old victim again in 2019. And how was the suspect found in Oregon? 
be, as you heard, our, the spokesman for OSBI, when a Saki test kit is entered into the, or the, the same test kit is entered into the laboratory, they, if they're able to extract the DNA, that's put into CODIS. CODIS is the modern day version of, of fingerprint tracking, except it tracks DNA. When that hit matched those two together, it says the only individual who left this DNA at the scene is this individual, and he was currently being held in Oregon. And he has now been transferred by the courtesy of Tulsa County Sheriff's Office. He now resides in David L. Moss, and he'll await uh, prosecution by the Tulsa County District Attorney. Is he attached to any other similar crimes across the country? Only of the four that I'm aware of that we spoke to you about. So these four are on top of what he's already been charged with? Would you say that again, please? Has he been charged previously? Yes. Is, is the case of the, there's three, is that part of the charging? Are those still coming? Still uh, I'll tell you what, I, I'm going to put him on the spot. I'm going to have our uh, special unit investigator. Uh, where'd he go? <laughs> Sergeant Vermeer, who doesn't like the limelight, but he can answer the specific questions about Tulsa Police Department's investigations. Yes, Sergeant Ryan Vermeer, V-E-R, space capital M-E-E-R. Sir, if you'll ask your question again, I'm, we'll see We'll see how well the sergeant does. I guess I'm just a little confused as to where we're at in, in the, the charging of, of this individual. Is he's currently facing charges, is that correct? He, he is, yeah. So to clarify, so the 2019 case, he was initially uh, arrested via a state warrant. Uh, later, that case was transferred uh, to the U.S. Attorney's Office to be prosecuted in the federal court system due to McGirt, uh, and that's how we ended up in federal prison in Oregon. Since then, there have been three additional CODIS hits, uh, and charges are pending on some of those hits for those new cases. Does that clear things up? Perfect. Yes. So is he also being charged locally on that, or is McGirt taking that out of your hands? He is not at this time for the 2019 rape. Okay. And what are the charges on the others? Uh, first degree rape. Okay. And in all three of those cases, he's being charged with first degree rape locally? I believe there are presently two counts of first degree rape. In one of those cases, the victim is currently um, not wishing to cooperate at this time. One of those cases. Do you have, can you tell us which case that is? Or? The 2015 case. Mm -hmm. Because these were children involved in some of these cases, does that uh, change how you charge? Uh, it can potentially change the charging decisions. It hasn't at this time. They've been charged as first degree rape, um, and that's the appropriate charge at this time, as opposed to uh, lewd molestation or sexual abuse by a minor. So, does he have any sort of previous criminal history um, he, other than this? He does. Um, I don't recall all of the prior convictions or cases off the top of my head, but I do know that he has an extensive history with us locally in Tulsa. And what is his age? He's in his low 30s now. I know when I worked the case on him in 2019, he would have been 28 at the time. Um, so doing the math on that, uh, 33, 34, possibly 35. So when this DNA was tested back in 2008, uh, did it not match to anybody? What, what took so long between 2008 and to now, or to 2008? Good, good question. So he initially didn't have a DNA profile in our system. In the course of my 2019 investigation, I authored a search warrant for a sample of his DNA um, for a paternity testing comparison, and then his DNA was entered into CODIS from there, which helped to further the other cases as well. And then what up the rest of them whenever his DNA was put? Yes. Okay. Again, I'd have to do the math on it. I believe he was a teenager, but I can't recall if he was 18 or 19 or if he was a juvenile at that time. I, I, I believe he was 17 or 18. I'm 17. 17? 17. Thank you. So what is the Oregon connection again? Um, yeah, so he was transferred to a federal prison in Oregon. That's where he was being held. So he doesn't have any sort of relation to that area? Not that I'm aware of, no.
here on a writ, or is he discharged? He he's currently in custody at David Omas right now, as of two days ago. It doesn't change, but we are currently in discussions with the district attorney's office in regards to still charging him with first degree rape uh, in that case, Is despite the fact. At this time? Not at this time, no. That's my understanding, yes. And as a point of information, a couple things um, I think. Uh, it should be noted is that this individual, while serving time in Oregon, was only days away from being released. Uh, so the timeliness of the DNA from our now deceased victim coming back, um, again, I think goes to the fact that although she may not be here physically, she's certainly here in spirit and her voice will continue to be heard. Uh, furthermore, just as another point of information, you will not have a mugshot of this individual um, so don't call us for one because he's in ICE custody and they do not take much shots of uh, those individuals. So we cannot provide that. So how long was his initial sentence and if he was only days away from being released? I'm not sure unless, Detective, you are, you're aware of that. Approximately three or so years. I can't say for sure. I don't know um, when he was in it initially convicted. Okay. And why is ICE holding him? He's not a citizen of this country. Diana. Do you know how long he was in Oklahoma? That I do not know. I just wanted questions about his citizenship status to be connected to him. Is that best? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.